near 50s make up 80% of all breast cancer diagnoses, but our next guest is not part of that statistic. In fact, at the age of 24, she had less than 1% chance of getting breast cancer, but she got it anyway. Please welcome Jillian to the show. Hi, Jillian. Tell us, how did you find out that you had breast cancer at 24? When I was 24, I was stretching, and I felt something that hurt on my left breast. So I had my um, gynecologist appointment uh, the next week, so I wanted to have it checked out. I totally forgot to let her know about it, and she felt it and immediately asked me, did I know something was there? I told her yes, and she immediately wanted me to go get an ultrasound done. Mm. The ultrasound technicians were very dismissive with me, unfortunately. Mm. They, really? yeah, they were not really worried. They kept double checking my age. Are you right. sure this is you? Do we have the right person? And they dismissed me and, and didn't think anything of it. My gynecologist really wanted to press me, though, to keep. Um, Going over, getting checked. Getting yeah. checked. That was what I was going to ask yeah. you, actually, because at 24, you know, I'm so glad your doctor jumped on it because She's a lot right. of people, doctors included, and like you said, with the ultrasound texting, oh, come on, you're 24. They, you know, right. it's not anything. Right. I mean, did some of that play into your head, too? Because I think there are probably a lot of young women that feel something and, oh, it's nothing. Mm. I'm 24. I, it's not right. anything. I started believing them because they said, oh, do your, you know, your mother or your aunts have uh, very dense breasts. And I mm -hmm. said, oh, yeah. So, they're putting it in your head that you're fine, you're fine. Um, and I didn't feel the need to advocate for myself at first. Mm. And then when my gynecologist was really pushing me to get a second opinion, that's when I started thinking, okay, this could be something. So what they finally tell you it was? So they finally told me um, that it was uh, stage zero breast cancer at first, okay. which I thought nothing of. You think of the number zero and right. you think that's nothing, right? right. So for further testing, um, I moved to Sloan Kettering. I didn't want to be at a breast specialist anymore. Mm. My mother was very insistent on moving to a cancer hospital. Right. Um, and then um, they actually did more testing and found that I was actually a stage one. And instead of getting a lumpectomy with radiation, I would need to get a single side mastectomy. Um, and see where I went from there with treatment depending on right. the results. So just to, to wow. clarify, so a lumpectomy means you keep your breast, they take the lump out of your breast, as opposed to what you said, a single side where they take one breast, not mm -hmm. both. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's what you were, it changed from one to the other. Exactly, okay. yeah. exactly. So what was going on in your mind? There was a lot going through my mind. I felt betrayed kind of by my body mm -hmm. as a young woman thinking, this is supposed to be when I'm discovering myself, when sure. I'm, right. you know, supposed to be out there living my life. I did get to travel, which was awesome right before I got diagnosed, but it was just a really difficult time to process that I would need to do all of these things that I didn't think a 25-year-old really have to worry sure. about. Right. So you had the mastectomy on one side. You, you had chemotherapy as well? Yes, I did. I needed to have chemotherapy after my mastectomy because they let me know that I was stage 2 at that point, and it did go into my lymph nodes. Wow. So, so you went, first it was 0, then it was 1, now it's yeah. 2. Now you have to be thinking, wait wow. a minute, come on. Can we stop guys? with the yeah. numbers, yeah. please? Stop exactly. That's right. So wow. you clearly had a fast-growing cancer. I know uh -huh. some cancers grow faster than others and slower. Yeah, it was either fast growing or I don't know if the first place I went to did a full enough yeah. biopsy yeah. because sure. Sloan Kettering did a full workup MRI biopsy right. and everything so mm -hmm. they covered all their bases what are you thinking about for the future am I going to be able to have children am I gonna mm -hmm. be able to safely conceive after chemotherapy because it does put your body into an early menopause mm -hmm. that makes it so that you might not be able to produce eggs so I did do um, egg freezing Mm -hmm. to ensure that if my uh, menstrual cycle did not return after chemotherapy, I had a backup plan. Wow. So that was a great insurance policy that, for me. Wow. Yeah, that was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so where you into great. fast yeah. thinking mode, right? Yeah. So you lost your breast, but you also lost your hair. So at first it was very difficult. They did let me know that it was a 100% chance that I was going to lose my hair. Mm -hmm. Some people tell you you might not. Right. So I actually sent my hair to a company that makes a wig out of your hair. Right. So when it's, they shaved wow. it. Wow. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay. exactly. So you cut your hair to a very short pixie cut, and they make a halo with a wig 
and it's your hair, so you're wow. more comfortable oh, and you feel nice. like yourself oh, still. I see. Okay, great. Wow. Um, <laughs> I wore it twice and said enough of this, and I embraced being bald the entire oh, time. That's wow, so great. that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> How strong you are. So your fiance Max, he was there with you through it all. Yes. How did this affect uh, your relationship with Max? I definitely thought that um, I had heard stories that people leave your significant other doesn't yeah. stick around because it's a really hard time, um, not only for you, but for the people with you that have to watch. Sure. So um, I definitely didn't think he would stick around. We had been together for about three years, mm -hmm. but I was not shocked, but obviously thrilled that he was there every step of the way. Aww, um, that's great. See, there are some <laughs> awesome Max. dudes out there. That's all I want to say. <laughs> And uh, if I don't mind saying, Max is here today. Max, yes, he is. Max, we want to know, how did you handle everything that Jillian went through? Tell us about that. Um, I just wanted to be there for her just to be a great cheerleader throughout mm -hmm. the whole thing. Um, obviously, I knew there was going to be ups and downs, but the best thing I could do was just be there for her. Um, wow. Tell her I love her. Tell her that she's still beautiful, uh, because she was. So when did you propose? How did that work out? Uh, on the last day of her chemo treatment, um, yeah, um, we just got the whole family together, my family, her family, and we told her that, you know, we just wanted to be there to celebrate her last day of chemo. Uh. So she thought nothing of it, and, um, you know, at, at, as she was getting off the chair, um, she looked the other way, and then she looked at me, and I was down on one knee um, with the ring. Aww. Let me yeah. Dude! That's so awesome. So, Jillian, what message do you want to give to people out there who may be watching? Definitely be your own advocate. Right. You know you best. You know your body best. Mm -hmm. And definitely seek support or help. I found this amazing group of women in New York called mm -hmm. the Breasties. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they are a nonprofit organization for women with breast, gynecological, reproductive mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. It's not your normal support group. You yeah. know, no. it's women empowering women. It's yeah. great. It's great. Oh, that's, that's, awesome. really, that's a really great message. All right. Julian, Christine, thanks so much for sharing your stories with us. Coming up next, we're going to give you the latest on how to detect and treat this destructive and deadly disease. Don't go away. heard from Christine and Jillian, two very brave women who've had tough battles with breast cancer, but they've come out on top. Joining us now to give us the very latest on breast cancer prevention and treatment is oncoplastic breast surgeon and functional medicine physician, Dr. Jen Simmons. Welcome, Hi. Dr. Jen. Thank you. Thank Good to you. see you. Yeah. Well, you know, as we mentioned before, about one in eight women in this country will be diagnosed eventually with breast cancer, yes. which is a scary number. What are the latest advances in treatment and detection for people at home who are watching right now? Yeah, so I think the really exciting things that are happening in terms of detection are early diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So our screening modalities just keep getting better and better. They're more and more sensitive, and we can pick up cancers at the very earliest of stages. We can mm -hmm. see three millimeter cancers, yeah. and maybe mammogram alone had that technology, but not in a dense breasted woman. Mm -hmm. And now we add in digital breast homosynthesis and molecular breast imaging, and it really changes that landscape because they're mm -hmm. far more sensitive in that dense breasted population, sure. which in general, it's not always synonymous, but most of the time we're talking about younger women. Mm. Right. And those are the people that we really want to capture those very early cancers in. Right. In terms of treatment, we now are in the age of molecular profiling. So even as much as 10 years ago or 15 years ago, we decided that women who had a tumor greater than one centimeter would just automatically get chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. or if they had nodal disease, they automatically got chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of women were getting chemotherapy. 70 to 80 percent of the women that were getting chemotherapy were having no benefit from it. Really? So all risk, no benefit. Mm -hmm. And now we have molecular profiling of these tumors so we can know who benefits from chemotherapy and we can also know what chemotherapy they benefit from. Right. So we have targeted drugs against targeted molecules and it's really changed the landscape. It's not only saved women 
from the side effects of chemotherapy with no benefit. Mm. But it's also giving us tremendous results in these, mm -hmm. in these women who are getting the drug because the drug is appropriate for them. What does the BRCA gene mean? What does it mean if you have it? Mm -hmm. Like, why is that so important for, you know, some of us to be tested for? Yeah. So we all have the BRCA gene. The importance or the significance is who has a mutation in that gene, whose mm -hmm. gene isn't functioning correct gotcha. correctly. Because what the BRCA gene does is it c prevents us from developing breast cancer. It, it corrects those, mm -hmm. those breast cancer cells that develop are supposed to get recognized and destroyed. But in people with a gene mutation, they don't have the ability to do that. Okay. So they get cancers at very young ages. Mm -hmm. Now that said, in that uh, population, we're talking about a small number of breast cancer patients because the mutation population is really only 5 to 10 percent mm -hmm. of the entire population of people who get breast cancer. So it's a small percentage that we're talking about. And in that group of people, the occurrence rate of breast cancer is around 80 per 7 percent over oh, their wow. lifetime. Mm -hmm. But it's not 100, mm -hmm. and that's the interesting thing, is what else is going on there? There must be other influencers. Right. So what I talk about is the study of epigenetics, or the things that we can do to influence our genes, mm -hmm. to decide if those genes get turned on or, or they don't get turned on at all. Mm -hmm. So the things that we can do to influence whether or not we get cancer. Right, wow. so the, which actually brings us right to prevention, right? Because that's what people want to know at home. They're saying, okay, well, what can I do today to help prevent breast cancer? In this traditional medical society, the mm -hmm. things that we talk about for prevention are drugs which will decrease the mm -hmm. likelihood that you get breast cancer. So a drug like tamoxifen, which affects the estrogen receptor on the breast cells. So that will decrease the likelihood that you will develop an estrogen positive or an estrogen sensitive cancer by about 50%. And then we talk about things like removing the breasts prophylactically or preventatively or mm -hmm. removing the ovaries. So th that's the traditional hat. I'm going to take off that traditional hat and put on my functional medicine hat mm -hmm. because there are things that every one of us can do today that will affect our health going forward and not only prevent cancer but pre prevent all the illnesses that plague our society. Mm -hmm. So and those things are eating a whole food, plant-rich diet. Mm -hmm. They are getting daily movement, and it's th something that has to make you happy. Right. Um, it's sleeping eight hours every night. It is having a mindfulness practice, a mind-body connection. Mm -hmm. It's detoxifying your environment, so mm -hmm. getting rid of all those chemical exposures that wreak havoc on, on our health. Right. And uh, the most important thing is our connection to one another, living a purpose-filled life mm. that fills you with joy because cancer doesn't grow in a joyful environment. Here's what's frustrating to people. You take Jillian's story. She's 24 years old. Yeah. If Jillian didn't notice the lump, she, she might have been a more advanced stage. That's exactly so right. I get that we can't do a mammogram on everybody, right, starting at age 21, but where do we stand now with the mandates and, and what's the best thing? How should women approach this? Because it's, it's still confusing to a lot of people. It is. Yeah, it's very confusing to me. Sure. I'm just going to put it well, out it there. Well, it changes all the time. Yeah. It, makes it sense. does. And, and you have to remember who you're getting that information from. Mm -hmm. So okay. in general, what I use is if you are the average person of average risk, first screen at 40 and then 40 on yearly for as long as you enjoy good health. Mm -hmm. If you have had a, an individual in your family diagnosed before the age of 40, then your start of mammograms is 10 years before your relative was diagnosed. Now mm. that wouldn't have helped you. And so I also say, we need to be our own advocates. I heard you say that, I agree completely. And we need to know ourselves, yeah. know our body, mm -hmm. know what, what feels right and know what feels wrong. And when it feels wrong, you have to stand true to that. Absolutely. And if your doctor says, no, don't worry about it, go find a right. new doctor. Yeah. Go That's find exactly, uh, I, you know what, I'm so glad you didn't yeah. say that because I, I just went to the doctor, you know, I had an mm -hmm. abnormal and, you know, I stay on top of it because of my mom. And mm -hmm. they actually said to me on the phone, it hasn't been a year. 
I'm in the process of talking to my insurance company, but even if they say we're not yeah. going to cover it, I'm still going to do it because I just want to know that I'm taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's what, it, yep. you know, that be really your own advocate. You have to yeah. be your own advocate. Yeah. Right. So thank you so much, Dr. Jen, for being here with us today. I mean, I believe, I feel that this information is just tremendously invaluable. So thank you so much. And I love that you're passionate about no. it. Thank you. <laughs> Please remember, ladies, all you ladies out there, get your annual mammogram. It could really, really save your life. There's more Dr. Nadiva coming up right after this.